Welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and Chris Lucian here as co-host and uh, definitely very, very excited today to have John Cutler on the show. Uh, we got so many excellent topics. I hope we can get to them all. If not, you know, just getting to one will be awesome. Uh, but, uh, you know, we got collective sense making. We got, um, you know, taking the spirit of mobbing and taking it to maybe non-code things and uh, shipping and learning are some of the topics we might hit today, but we'll see where it goes. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, John, do you mind uh, giving an introduction about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me too. This is, I'm, I've been looking forward to this now for months. So this is awesome. This is a great day. Um, so yeah, so my name is John Cutler. Um, I currently work at a company called Amplitude where I'm a product evangelist, where you could think of me as sort of like a voice of the company. I do a lot of workshops with customers, uh, future customers, kind of doing workshops most of the day uh, in some ways. Um, but you know, my goal every day is to help people think about product development. I don't really sell our product, which is kind of cool. The product is just an extension of that. So it's sort of like I'm an extension of the company as a product. Um, and I do what I really like to do. I, I use Twitter a lot and um, it's kind of an understatement. And I blog about things and write, I think I have about 700 blog posts sitting out there floating around and draw doodles and everything. So this was kind of a dream job. It's like an extension of my normal flow. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I do. And I have a background in product management and UX research. Um, companies here in Santa Barbara, Appfolio, where I used to work and Zendesk, uh, other crazy ad tech places and Viacom and MTV. And, and then the funny part is I had a video game. My first product was a bartending CD-ROM game called Last Call, which you can find on YouTube. Um, and it was built in like director or something. Um, and, and it's a game where you did never call a game last call because it's like not, you can't really make a sequel unless it was called after hours. That was the idea to call it after hours. Um, <laughs> but we never, but it was banned because it had like lewd content in it. So mm. Kmart decided not to cover it. So anyway, that's a whole other story of the video game getting banned, but that's a little bit about me. <laughs> right. right on, right on. Well, I guess, uh, so many good things. Let's jump right into, uh, Collective sense making, both by shipping and other ways. So, uh, what are your thoughts here, John? Yeah, I think where we were going with that was, you know, I I sort of been involved in the agile community. I'm a product manager, you know, involved in shipping code, right? Um, but as I started to think about it more, I started to really think about this kind of sense and respond loop or we have this saying at Amplitude, are you shipping faster than you learn or learning faster than you ship? And so what I've increasingly seen, and, and, and it's kind of fascinating because I think it really depends on who you're talking to. I think that a lot of companies are actually learning faster than they can ship. Like, like fundamentally, they have a problem. Um, they're wading through maybe a lot of debt or this is very difficult for them to deliver anything at any rate. But I guess maybe just due to the luck of the different companies I've worked at and the companies I interact with, the other end of the spectrum are companies that are shipping way faster than they can learn. So their ability to deliver stuff is far outpacing their ability to sense whether any of this stuff is working in the market. And so that, that's kind of where I was going with that thinking where I think it's putting a pressure on teams to really think about what the constraint is. Is the constraint how fast you're delivering software? Um, and I remember sort of saying to Gene Kim or talking to him about this, and I was like, well, how much of the investment is going to knowing whether any of this stuff is working the way that you think? Like if, if you were to spend time developing new features versus figuring out how to know how people are using the product right now, or as we used to do at Appfolio, we used to get in a van um, and go and visit customers and just step away from the keyboard for a week. Uh, that was a better use of our time <laughs> to do it. So that's kind of where I'm, I, I'd be curious on your, your all's thoughts with it, because it's something, you know, that I think about a lot where it's important to talk about. It's also important to talk about that it's not everyone's constraint. You know, you really could be in a situation where just building the muscle to deliver anything could be a major advance. And then maybe just building the muscle to deliver something that's even marginally useful could be an advance. And then building something that's marginally impactful for a customer could be an advance. And it keeps on kind of going as a, as a muscle we need to build more and more and more. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. I don't know what you all think 
um, about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually really like the idea because, um, you know, you can definitely have a, uh, a really tight uh, development cycle without, you know, you know, tons of customer feedback or, um, or not even customer feedback, but maybe like heat maps and stuff, just the automated data collection about what the customer is doing. Um, and, and I think I have a couple of stories, uh, you know, once I was working with the military and, you know, the feedback loops were slow. So we were, we were kind of like in that space of not shipping fast and not learning fast. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then, you know, uh, an emergency kind of started happening and, and they, they, they kind of said, we need software right away. And we just need this working and in production as fast as possible. And, and so then it went to, um, we're delivering fast and we're learning fast. So, so there's, it was kind of like a light switch, you know, um, where they went from one to the other, but I've, I've been in other situations where delivering fast and learning slowly existed. Um, and, and in those, in those cases, a lot of the times, uh, you know, as a developer, I, I, I just say, Hey, let's just throw Google analytics on this page real fast. It's a <laughs> one line copy and paste. And we'll just see if anybody goes to this part of the site. And, and all of a sudden they're like massive changes happening in the application based on a tiny little bit of data. Um, and, and so, yeah, you know, it's, it's def I've definitely had experiences, you know, over, um, over my career of being in each of the, each of those scenarios, I think. Um, and then the, the learning fast and delivering slowly. I don't know if that's as common as <laughs> delivering slowly and learning slowly. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great way. To, I mean, really that would happen right where, you know, there's just almost like a massive inventory of learning. Now, the problem there, too, is that inventory of learning is growing stale, too. So it's depreciating sitting there. But that would happen, for example, you know, it happens a lot in industries where it's like our field sales team, we have people in touch with customers every single day. We, we, we have all this stuff. We just, we just, there's the word just, like we just know we need to ship, but we can't execute it. We just need to execute. We just need to ship this particular thing. I'm just acknowledging that sometimes that happens, right? Like if you, if, if things do grind to a halt, you can't accumulate this inventory of learning. I think one other interesting part is you could think on a macro cycle for a company that at first, you know, you, you haven't really done anything yet. And then you learn a little bit, which is the kind of kernel of the idea. And you kind of go in and out, you know, it's natural to kind of, it's not like you ride the perfect line between shipping and learning. It's yeah. more like you're, you're, you're dipping into the kind of learning area. Then you come back, you're in this sort of period of like a lot of execution and a lot of delivery. And then as the business matures, often there's like a little less to learn. <laughs> so if, as you've had a product that's been out in the market for a while, you know, you've got the backlogs, like you've got the, you've, you, you're very rarely surprised by feedback from customers. So I think that's another thing that's important mentioning is that there's almost like macro cycles of this. I think the trouble though, is a company that is so confident that it's learned everything. And then really it's, it's getting disrupted, you know, like it's, it, it really has not flipped the switch into the new, it hasn't hit the inflection point where it needs to dip back into the learning well again. <laughs> Uh, to do that. So yeah, it's a kind of interesting way to think about it. I, I think about it a lot. Yeah. And I, actually, I'm, um, I'd be curious, uh, this is an area of learning and growth for me that I've really been uh, striving to get better at lately. And I kind of have a story and I'd kind of like your advice on it a little sure. bit. Uh, yeah. Is uh, So I joined a team and it kind of was, it kind of felt like the scenario. You're it's talking a cigar. About. <laughs> Sorry, okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I guess it's all. All right, done. <laughs> uh, Sorry, we could. No, end. no, no worries. Uh, so I, when I joined the team, they uh, maybe were in the 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 space where you talk about the were at least internally it felt like learning was high, but yeah. the ability to ship was low. So a lot of okay. things weren't automated. It was hard to get things out. It was a slow process. So we worked really hard to hit, reach that kind of like CD uh, continuous delivery zenith, right? Where yep. And so we automated a ton. We really sped up the feedback loops internally. So like, even if we weren't shipping to the customer on day one, we we're getting internal feedback every day or very quickly. And then we were at the point where we could release daily or multiple times daily to the customers. 
And so we kind of overcome some of those hurdles. And then I kind of reached a point of kind of like, okay, so we have all this CD, we have all this, what's next? What am I, you know, are we missing something else? You know what I mean? And, and that's when you started talking about like, I, I believe on this team, there was a lot of feedback coming from people in the field, like, mm. you know, who work with the customers kind of bottling up. And then that's kind of like fed our backlog, backlog. But I didn't feel like, maybe it's just like, I didn't feel trendy. Like we didn't, weren't using these cool analytics or these new UX, you know, things to really make sure that we're learning what the customer really wants and what's to do, you know, like, is there a next step when it's yeah, that's kind of reached that? And, and, yeah. and we always say this, at, I'm the first person to say this. I mean, I work at a company that focuses on quantitative, like analytics like that, but you know, the qualitative stuff is super, super, super important. And in fact, sometimes the quantitative stuff is just helps us guide us in the direction of qualitative things. And then the qualitative stuff might get us curious about what to measure um, on that side. So there's, you know, th this idea that everyone needs to be like Netflix, you know, A-B testing every like micro little change. I think a lot of people get obsessed by that because they're obsessed by the idea of certainty. They're obsessed by the idea that the systems will tell them you are great you have made the right decision in most products. And look, even at Netflix, when it comes to long, mid to long-term strategy, you can't A-B test that. You know, you're not like A-B test. They, uh, Gibson Biddle has a great talk where he goes through 10 years of Netflix iteration to work on one capability. Failure, 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 slight little movement, failure, 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 slight little movement, strategy, movement, strategy, movement. And so one thing to think about, I think, is that people think the quantitative side, people look to the quantitative side for especially maybe more like analytically minded people want that level of certainty that it works 100%. So yeah, to make that clear in the beginning, I think sometimes the uh, you know, sometimes people think the next level is just fancier forms of experimentation. And certainly in some businesses, those are the really interesting things happening. Like imagine running, you know, 200 concurrent AB multivariate experiments behind feature flags, and you've got to determine what's impacting what and has anything broken. There's a lot of stuff in observability around that. Like, are we these super complex systems? That's certainly like next level in its own regard. But for a lot of companies too, it's, how do we get more strategic? You know, how do we place a portfolio of bets? Like we're very safe at the moment. We're just kind of exploring the same area and we keep kind of coming back to the same thing. How, if, if you think of a product as a series of promises that we keep and that basically we reinvent how we keep those promises, the promises tend not to go away. They were the same 20 years ago as they were right now. And what you find is then I would ask a team, well, what, what are your riskiest bets <laughs> to reinvent how you keep that promise? And that I think is for a lot of teams when they feel like they've just maxed out. Yes, there are some fancier techniques to eke and optimize every little tiny bit of the thing of the product. Um, and sometimes those create step changes and new novel findings. And certainly companies like Airbnb and other people have great examples of doing amazing work with that it's not necessarily the next level for every team about where they're at. So sometimes it is actually the ability to place kind of longer brewing bets or trying to find these unique angles of a customer job that you've been really good at doing, but could you reinvent how, that, how they do that? And so I think that that's the next level for a lot of teams is creating, how do you place a portfolio of bets? Some that are like a lot riskier where you can learn faster and then some that are a lot safer that are probably less likely to kind of change the business. So I think that I, I have a talk called think, think big, work small. And the basic idea is that, okay, so what, what do we used to do? We used to plan big, work big. Okay. Well, we realized that didn't work. Right. So then people started to basically, uh, you know, okay, so let's like work smaller. Okay, so they plan big, but then they figured out how to work smaller. Okay, so we're going to do the project in a bunch of different chunks. Okay, awesome. Okay. And then it seems like we got down to this area where people like, they're like, think small, work small. Okay, great. Yeah, we're kind of working, working, working. It's great. And what, what they lost when they did that is it was sort of like we exchanged waterfalls for whirlpools. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're just kind of going around in circles and don't know what's going on. And so I think that that's the next level for a lot of teams is, okay, they've stopped planning big, working big. They, you know, they started to think about more outcome oriented, like 
user focused outcomes. They've got that nailed down, but now they need to like pivot back, not into planning big, but thinking big, like where do we need to take the company? What are the riskier bets we need to make at the moment? I don't know if that helps Austin, but that's like what, what your question inspired. Um, Yeah, no, I really like that a lot because I think think big and maybe, uh, what was it act small or something like that? Yeah, yeah like think big, work small. Yeah. Work small. Because work, work small yeah. is a muscle. Yeah. Legitimately working small is better. Okay. Yeah. But if you're working small and thinking small, <laughs> yeah. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't. And, and a lot of the agile folks too, it sort of annoys me because I feel like I, I was like, well, what's the last product company you worked at? Like, I get it. But the idea of, well, you know, just kind of wander down the hall and, I showed them this. Oh, that's kind of useful. Can you build that for me? Yeah, sure. I can build it because I architected it so extensively and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to optimize anything and, and I'm, I can work so fast that you just change your mind and I'll be there for you. you know, it's amazing. And like, I get the emotion, like I get the whole idea there, but it's not how a lot of the, it just doesn't register with a lot of the really successful teams that I work with that are balancing that keen ability to work tiny and small, but also thinking in quarters, you know, thinking yeah. about a bet that they're playing out. Um, so I don't know. If that, well, yeah, I don't know. There's a little bit of like myth and reality with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so I think I do see a lot of this, like, um, you know, maybe there is a long-term plan, a roadmap for a product. Right. And uh, a team might be delivering small, at, but um but then on the product, uh, but that roadmap never seems to change, even though new <laughs> information makes it in, right? right? And so I'll see, I'll see thinking big, working small, um, and uh, and blindly following a plan. Yeah, right? that's kind of planning big, <laughs> yeah. right? Like that's the <laughs> annual roadmap, and it doesn't do it. And so, for example, yeah. the workshops that I get tied up in doing. Uh, which I love is something called the North Star Framework. And in the North Star Framework, you actually come up with a framework that represents the value exchange in your product, like the promises, the capabilities your product does, but it's completely agnostic to solutions. Mm -hmm. And so that stays stable relatively. That's the thinking big, like, okay, that's our hypothesis. But the minute your hypothesis changes, you change the North Star And also the options and experiments you want to run will definitely change and inform each other. You know, like uh, Amplitude, one of, you know, our North Star is weekly learning users, not weekly querying users. Because if you sit around querying an analytics product all day, you're not doing your work. You're just sitting and querying an analytics product, right? So a weekly learning user has these elements of like sharing their learning with their team, collaborating because our product's focused on collaboration. So our inputs are basically... Um, activated accounts, you got to data into the system. It's got to be clean. It's got to be working and running and you've got to get your team onboarded, broadcasting the learnings, which is like I share with Chris a learning. And then consumption of learning is the long tail learning of the learnings that I share. So if it becomes the dashboard for our team, that becomes something that like, that's another input. But the interesting thing is that hasn't changed in the three years I've been at Amplitude, how we've focused on solving those and moving those levers has definitely changed to do it. So that's that kind of like think big is you got this big idea. We're not planning big, but we're, we're, we, we've got a hypothesis out there. That's, that's bold and interesting. And then we're obviously trying to work small, you know, we're trying to experiment. So, so to me, like it kind of gives you a a feeling of maybe, um, you know, to me, it's, it's thorough exploration of the 80, 20 rule. Yeah. Um, So like, (laughs) you know, at all levels of the product. So, you know, I, um, cause you know, I don't want to be feature complete in this one area. I want the 20% that the 80% of the users are going to use and in that area. And then I want to then satisfy this other area and this other area and this other area. And, and as the product gains adoption, then start exploring that 20 to 80% or the 20 to hundred percent of remaining features in that area. Um, and, but I see lots of people do micro iterations down that same path and then be, right. become feature complete everywhere. Um, and, uh, and they just, they sacrifice all the, the benefits that they get from lean or agile, that sort of thing. Yeah. And it's, um, 
I, yeah, Austin, I didn't know if you, I if you had something to say. I don't want to jump Please in. Please go. Um, Please go. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking there too that this idea, back to this idea of promises that the product keeps and thinking about that, like a very common thing is, you know, what are those teams doing? Well, they're just shine. They're just like, they're just spit polishing the, the product. They're just like finishing up. What's that team? They're innovating. Yeah. Oh, they're innovating over there. And it's the same promise. And they basically, um, they basically siloed the team. Like, that's why I'm not too comfortable. Like there's these ideas of like pioneers, settlers, town planners, or, you know, are you the loon shop person or are you the, it kind of makes people out that we're all very unidimensional. And I think this comes to the sense-making thing and kind of moving beyond stereotypes that people have where, you know, yeah, I might want to do that pioneering thing for 12 months, but then I want to slip into this other mode, you know? <laughs> Like, so I think that that's one element here too, that your comment reminded me of is what does it mean to innovate? And then where do, how do we silo those people? And then what would it mean for a product team to always maintain like a nice portfolio of bets? Like, oh, we can water the plants with watering cans right now, or we can deliver the water by drone. The drone thing may not work. So you know what? We're probably not gonna be successful at doing that. But if we wait like 10 years or assign it to drone team X, or just try to outsource it to some other company, like we're not gonna, we're not gonna build the muscle to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, maybe one, uh, I think you've kind of answered it, but I'll ask a clarifying question, clarification question to make sure I got it. So like, um, you know, think big, work small, might be like big, big thing, but then you run a small experiment to find out if it works from the market yeah. or whatever. So big doesn't necessarily mean like time or size is kind of what I'm hearing. It could be right. big as far as what's a differentiator in the market or what's uh, you know big cost of delay return or you know any of the, that kind of stuff. Totally, it is not. That is a great point because I think you know MBA students, everyone is persuaded to think of like bold vision, big vision, you know, chatbot strategy or something like that. Like, yeah. uh, like it's very. You know, yeah, bigger, bigger is better. The plan, you know, you know what? Your first 90 days, then dream up how you're going to spend money in the next 12 to 18 months. And then you'll spend that and you'll get forgiveness for another year. And at that point, you've been at the company two to three years, and then you can just leave gracefully and then probably get paid more to join another company. And no one will know why it didn't work too. So there's this like, there's this whole push to basically push for big batches and big ideas to carve out the budget, carve out the space you need totally not that type of thinking. What I mean by that is thinking like, so when I mentioned the amplitude example is really thinking holistically, like casting a big net to our perception of the market, the strategy we need. And in fact, a good strategy, I mean, I really like in good strategy, bad strategy he makes the point that we should learn strategy from the underdogs, not from the people with endless resources, right? Because you don't have endless resources. So the idea when you're a small company of like, we just need to execute. They're looking at the massive company that has so much fire. Like I hate military stuff, but they've got like a lot of pawns to throw at the problem, you know? And if you look at those companies, you are not going to be able to be like that company. You're not going to juggle 18 balls in the air. You're like not going to be able to do it. So in fact, it's sort of counterintuitive, but by thinking big and sort of mapping out what you think of the space, it might actually end up with a very narrow area of focus where you think the fulcrum point is, the leverage point is in the business. So it's counterintuitive. Like you, you maybe I should come up with a better, it's not think, yeah, it's not think big batch or big plan. It's sort of thinking holistically about the problem yeah. <laughs> as it stands right there. And so a lot of the workshops I do is I'm like, you know, they'll say something like, okay, the initiative is shift to the cloud. I'm like why? That's a solution. What do you mean it's a solution? It's like, what well, we've got to do for our transformation. I was like, well, no, no, it isn't. Like maybe shift to the cloud is the wrong idea. Like why is the cloud the better thing? What are you trying to achieve with the shift to the cloud? Oh, uh, it's gonna be faster. Why do you need faster? Like, let's get down to the real mental model here. Like what is the crux bet here? Is it you're gonna go out of business if you can't ship or is it that like you need to innovate? And so at the end of that exercise that happened this morning, it was, we're in an industry that throws a lot of new complex data types and data models and things we need to understand. And it's extremely difficult to have new business without a way to be able to scale the kind of complex domains that we need to cover in an on-prem solution. Okay, now I've got something to work with. 
So the strategy is you're scaling out to new asset types with new types of customers, and you need to be able to think about how to absorb complexity into your system without it manifesting in every piece of on-prem software you need to run to do it. So that's like, that's what I mean by thinking big is just like keep, it's not like why, why, why necessarily as much as it's assume that that's a solution. What is the problem again? Assume that's the solution. What is the problem again? Assume that's a solution. What is the problem again? So that's, maybe that's an example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, your comment earlier about uh, allowing people to to move between roles or uh, in in the uh, in the town, um, I think was a good segue for the specific examples of applying the mobbing idea or spirit to non technical mm. teams. So just wanted to kind of explore that a little bit and and see what you what you yeah. Were... I mean, first I would kind of shine. I mean, I I mean we had like. Woody at a company that I was at, like I follow the work and, you know, so I've participated in this, um, I think had Tim Ottinger barking at me in a room or something. I was trying, I've done this, some of this, right. But like, yeah, what is the current thinking on the cross-functional nature of the mob? Like that would be, I would, I would ask that question. Just, I'm interested. Now you can help me out. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I think there's an extreme version of this, uh, Val Labs in Japan, they manage train data. They're really interesting, but um, they mob everything. They, they mob HR, they mob finance, they mob, uh, they, they, they mob everything, like the whole, the whole company. Um, and and we're also when I was visiting their offices, like they had a safe release train, but it was every role across the business. And so it was this giant wall with what everyone was doing and like how and why. And it was, it was just, it was, it was really, really interesting. Um, so like, that was like the most extreme example uh, I've seen. Um, but, uh, you know, for us, like cross, you know, uh, cross-functional, um, Austin, I don't know if you, you want to talk about it a little bit. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we, we strive for as much diversity as we can. But you, you can only, you know, stretch so far as it comes to roles and backgrounds and perspectives. And uh, but, you know, so we just are always seeking that as much as we can. So, I mean, we, we love hiring people from multiple different backgrounds, whether it's QA, whether it's uh, I love pulling non-technical people into the mob as much as possible to be like, hey, we're struggling with this design. Can you come in and give us rapid feedback as we change it? And then Sometimes they give the feedback and, you know, go away or sometimes they hang out and they love it. You know, I've heard of some mobs Whoa. where the product type person is maybe not on the call all day with the mob, but one screen is looking at what the mob is doing the whole day. And so if they see something interesting, they'll pop into the call and be like, hey, I have feedback on that or, or whatever. And yeah, so, yeah. We, we, had a, we had a product owner. We have a product owner that would actually lead, you know, it's a remote team and we're, we're using like TeamViewer or any desk, but they, they basically had the TeamViewer up all day um and and just spontaneously jumping into the mob whenever they saw something that they were working on and, and they had feedback wow. on yeah um so and, and those those are the sorts of like product owner relationships that we really uh looked forward to um we've also had other uh we've invited people to mob that were like in the finance department that nice. you know, just like completely unrelated, like not, not part of the work, but just like, Hey, come and experience this for a little bit. Like, and that's been good too. If you sit them in front of Excel, they'll probably like spec out all the business logic you need right there. Yeah. yeah like, exactly. you Excel, you'll be good. <laughs> they're like, Oh, they're like writing object oriented, you know, like Excel. Well, you, you're like, yeah. Oh, okay. We can solve the problem for us. At the yeah. Yeah. It's funny. And, and then one other thing I'll just add is the more typical, mobbing for us is where it's like, you know, a full day of mobbing is more technical cross functionality. So like in my current yeah. mob, we have a, a solid DBA uh, person and uh, we have me who's kind of more from a QA, you know, kind of, you know, coachy, you know, interpersonal lean agile background, uh, maybe TDD background. They have some people who just been traditional developer. We also have someone who loves automation. So they're always looking to script anything manual. And so, uh, so it's it's cross uh, functional, but maybe more on the tech side. Uh, That's super helpful. I mean, one of my big things that is this idea of like you know start together, work together, finish together, <laughs> and so starting together is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I mean, I'm passionate about all three of those. The finishing together is the outcome part, right? Like 
that starts it, work together. People generally understand. They're like, oh, I'll kind of work together. They don't really understand, but they they think they get it. The start together is a lot more contentious. It's like, wait a second, no, that's going to be totally messy. You know, like start start together. Everyone in the room, you know. So I'll say, well, um, yeah, the whole team should start together. We should. When, when I was here in Santa Barbara, I worked at a company here, and we would they've kind of shifted it over the years depending on how they do, but we might spend a week or two, you know, stepping away from keyboards, doing research together, UX research would, we were mobbing together. Um, we were going on site with customers. Now they, they sort of, they stepped away from doing that kind of religiously all the time, depending on the effort, but when it's really important, they would do that, which is really funny because in Silicon Valley, at least, it's actually not necessarily, or in a lot of the companies, it's not necessarily a very, it's a highly individualistic approach with very, very, very clear boundaries of control. So you are a design leader, you are a tech leader, you meet with the product manager, you will tee up the effort perfectly, you will work on it for three months beforehand, you will write the stories, you will give the product requirements document. Th these companies just happen to ship pretty quickly. Like other, otherwise though, in the balance, they're still pretty like, pretty like staged in how they're doing it. So I find that pretty fascinating that like the, and they will reject the idea of starting together. Oh my goodness, that's so inefficient. Oh, I mean, everyone will get so bored listening to customer calls all day or, you know, no one wants to talk strategy. And I'm like, you know, that person's like an expert settlers of Catan player. Like <laughs> they understand strategy. Like don't, like you're, you're sort of diminishing the people in the room. <laughs> Yeah, to do the things. Um, yeah, awesome. <laughs> okay. So you get the idea that it's like, it is very interesting to me that something, it's even something like starting together can be pretty contentious, but that's sort of in my world when I'm thinking about a, a really cross-functional kind of mob or group of people and sense-making, you know, there's not code writing happening at that particular moment, but it's certainly like, um, you know, we'll using event storming, for example, is like really effective activity to get different people involved. Interesting thing about event storming is, you know, I really do, it, it takes everyone to step a little outside of their comfort zone. So, you know, developers want to make it very, very quickly about a data model, you know, and then you've got a UX researcher who's coming from a background of customer journey mapping. And then you have a product manager sort of like, well, wh why are we doing, you know, when are we going to get to work? What are we going to do? And you're inviting people from the business in there who are very domain focused, have no idea what the developers and designers are doing with all the sticky notes on the wall. They're just sitting there answering questions. So I think that event storming is a really great example of how everyone needs to step outside of their comfort zone a little bit to... Yeah create, but once you get it going, like once the group gets up there and they're, once they are making sense of things, like once their mind is being expanded with every new sticky note up on the wall, it is really like magic to see everyone kind of contributing. And, and in a sense, they are kind of mapping logic. You know, they are kind of thinking about a lot of things at once, but that's one thing that's I, I'll just end with that is that I'm a big advocate. There's different traditions. There's a lot of stuff within design around, you know, design, does that like the UX side of it, which is about making sense of things and mapping a space and mapping a domain and understanding like the nouns and verbs that the people use. There's tons of stuff in the design community. And then if you go into the domain driven design community or the BDD community, there's a whole other world of that. And I was surprised that those worlds don't talk a lot. Like no wonder the developers think that designers are just making mock-ups and the designers just think the developers are just executing a code. They haven't seen <laughs> these traditions across the aisle for doing that. So a UX person is doing an event storming exercise and like, okay, this is kind of like customer journey mapping, but we're also fleshing out the information architecture. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay. And then the developers, there's like, we're kind of doing functional, like fun functional, I'm not an expert in this, but like, we're kind of doing functional programming and I'm thinking about the data model. Yeah. And then they're, they're both using their words, but they're talking about a very similar thing. And the product manager is like, well, we're figuring out what the problem is here. You know, so they're each using their own language, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, um, I think in our in our flow, because we, we work on IoT projects and we have mechanical designers, firmware engineers, electrical mm. engineers, and, and software engineers all working together. Um, and so what you described, uh, it, you know, it wasn't like this 10 years ago, but I think 
today, um, you know, we really do, we say, hey, we're going to build this piece of, uh, of, of hardware. And it's, it's mechanical, electrical, firmware, uh, and, and software um, uh, often is started roughly around the same time. All, mm. Everybody's kind of starting together. Um, they're not, you know, obviously mobbing, you know, uh, yeah. but, um, you know, maybe some of the, those, the un- other engineering roles are kind of treating it in, in a more traditional way, but um, we do, we do see, we have started more of this like uh, cross team or, or cross departmental lean coffees happening yeah. uh, and just talking about how do we work better together often um, and, uh, and trying to come up with action items about, you know, how, how to work well together in, in this cycle. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been really good. So it, it's kind of evolved to that once the software um, was, was operating in a certain way. So, so that's been a, a really good side effect. I mean, you need the foundation of those things. We have uh, Jack McCloy is on our uh, team at Amplitude is working on our design systems like thing. And, and, and he, that's just a great example of you need certain technology and things to fall into place I mean, I remember being a PM on the team and just seeing these uh, designer and developer just struggling to work together because it was more <laughs> like, I'm doing this in Figma. And then it's like, oh, you know, the, like, and, and then, and then, and then literally after thinking about this, it's, you know, the, the designer's like, oh, this is really cool. Can I just start checking in this stuff? Like you've just, you know, why don't, like I'm working on it, you're working on it you know, the, 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 uh, the developers kind of thinking about other logic and like what call, like mocking the calls and the develop and the designer is sitting there and writing the front end and doing that particular thing. And I think that that's just like magic. I think that that's where, you know, even, you know, in tools like Figma and the design community, now there's increasing appreciation that this will eventually not be a case of handing over that you are, you know, the, the, that whatever the no code examples, but Figma is a good example. It's like a designer playground, but there's increasing awareness that you are actually like thinking about logic and kind of proto coding these things. And, and so I think that that's super exciting, but also explains for some teams where they're like, we tried it, it sucked. Well, of, of course you tried it, it sucked because you sat around for like five hours waiting for something to happen. Like that's not really magical or fun <laughs> to do that. Definitely, definitely. And it, what I hear from the, the examples you all are talking about, whether it's firmware or whether it's design or whatever the cross functionality is, is um, the kind of returning to that theme you brought up, John, of collective sense making, that the magic and the, the almost, in many cases, instant buy in people have once they see the magic happening, <laughs> once yeah. they experience it. Because there is, I've been hearing some horror stories lately on uh, social media of people being put in their place, like, oh, you're a developer, you can't speak up about the design, or you're, you shouldn't be speaking about the product, or, you know what I mean, or, you know, and it coming from both sides, and that kind of thing, and I think, you know, these event storming, or mobbing, or whatever collective sense-making thing you can do, cross-link, team-link coffees, once people start seeing the value of the multiple perspectives, the light bulbs I've seen go off before, and and maybe this is a covert way, maybe it's a little controversial, but I've been doing it more lately, <laughs> is that whenever, it's almost like ad hoc mobbing (laughs) where as soon as I start to see those maybe biases forming or like people waiting or oh those guys over there I'm just like well let's just add them to the call and let's figure it out right now you know (laughs) and then like that's an amazing point I mean it also speaks to the idea of I mean I write all these funny things about high work in progress or other things like that and and so this is there's two funny quotes that come from that one is talking to a team they're like we know it's working when we spend longer on it so to me, that's the epitome of product thinking. And exp- that doesn't mean that they are spending a long time shipping things. It means that when they're on a roll, <laughs> there's good learning coming back in and they keep going. Like, that's amazing. You know, you're not like a factory line. You're not there to, and that really kind of challenged my thinking about Kanban and other things. But the other perspective of that too, is just creating an environment where anyone can breathe and show up at a meeting and spend like the kind of serendipitous moments of collaboration to do that. And that's another aspect of that starting together. It's like, is it okay to spend a whole day? Anyone who's done a startup knows that you often will spend a whole day doing something and then realize you were just totally didn't do anything. Like you were talking the whole time, but you weren't making any sense. And then you go home at night and you write an email at 10 PM to the co-founder and be like, 
I got it. We weren't even talking about the right thing. Like we got to go in to talk about this. And then you start the next day and you build off of that. But then at the end of the day, you start not understanding each other. It's really hard to make sense of things <laughs> when you're working as a group. And so if you don't have the bandwidth to think, if you're kind of pressured into these sprints, if you're pre if, if everything is sort of mapped out for you, I think that that's another, like we need time and space because the, the, the thing I've noticed a lot is that a lot of product managers very much want to involve developers in aspects of strategy and thinking about this stuff. And then they wonder, well, why is the developer not interested? They must not care about the product. They just care about coding or whatever. You go and talk to the developer and like, actually our whole incentive structure as an engineering team is shipping stuff. And I have a day job and you're asking me to do this and I really, really want to help you, but I don't have time. Like, I don't have time to help you. And so there's this kind of, you, you need that. It, this kind of goes into incentive structures in the company and what people are, you know, what, what the structures, the sprints we create, and the points and all oh, crap. Like it, it all boils down to like, are you creating these moments where you can kind of take those little diversions? Um, yeah, all in all to say is it's hard. And if we don't leave time for it, or space or energy for it. It's also really en energy, like it's energistically taxing. If you go into these conversations where you think you keep spinning around, if you're not on, you think that this is the biggest waste of time. But if you're on, you're kind of like, okay, we didn't really get anywhere, but I learned so much more than I did an hour ago. And so I think a lot of developers who try to do this pairing with UX or product, no one's in the right mindset. They try it and they're like, I don't care about the strategy. Please, can you just figure out the strategy? Like, just tell me what to build, please. Like, don't put me in another one of those rooms where you like get the Google slides out again. Like, take get me out of there. So this has a lot to do with like the energy you have in the environment you create uh, to do it. Yeah, and, and I'll give uh, maybe one testimonial of <laughs> the, the, the system fighting against this collective sense making. I've been there, I've seen it. Yeah. I switched to where mobbing was kind of the way to go. And what I immediately recognized was it wasn't like the whole, the whole team, you know, product, UI, UX, firmware was incentivized to work together and we mm. all owned it. And so it didn't yeah. feel like anybody was stepping on anybody's toes. It was all encouraged to, everyone's part of this. You know what I mean? And that is a huge, and that's what I was saying about a lot of people. Yeah when you're deep in the Silicon Valley world, a lot of people don't realize how individualistic, how it's sort of promotion driven development yeah. um, it's, or it's employee retention driven development. And the two are related, which is sort of like, well, we got to keep that person. They want to use Kafka. So all right, y'all we're like, we're going to use cup. Like we're going to do a pub sub system for that. And someone's like, we don't really need to do that. Oh, but they wanted to try, they wanted to try this technology. And so like 12 to 18 months later, people are like, well, what did Joe ship? Well, well, Joe is like collecting the stock options and is now on to the next company at that point. So like, so that's like weird. Talk about incentives and talk about um, the companies also we use as role models. I think it's important to have diverse set of role models for how companies work. That's why I like how you all, you know, not specifically talking about your employer, just promoting how people tell stories about other ways of working gives a nice counterbalance <laughs> to like the myths and heroes that we create out of the Bay Area, for example. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, we're running up on time. So uh, John, is there anything that you wanted to plug or share before we close? No, I mean, this has just been great. This is like, I've been looking forward to months. Like I said, this is amazing. We can chat forever about it. Uh, nothing to, to plug. Um, yeah, I mean, reach out on Twitter. Like I always try to answer all these particular questions. Um, probably do my wrap up of the beautiful mess blog posts again for this year. So we're in about hundred blog posts deep of this new project or 90 or 80 once a week. Nice. And I did a book for the first year, the wrap up, and I'll probably do that again. I'm getting itchy though. I did a 41 a and 41 B last night. So obviously <laughs> like I'm trying to get them all into the year. Um, maybe, maybe do that, but um, yeah, just reach out. It's fun. Yeah. And, and I think, tell the stories. And one thing I think I, yeah, one offer would be is if you can't tell the story yourself and you want someone to kind of like talk to you, I did this for a CTO friend recently. And there's a Twitter thread that was just like blew up where he said, I do not want to talk about this. I cannot talk about it, but the world needs to know about it. And it was a story <laughs> about how he basically 
like pulled the brakes completely on everything. And then the next day they just started like had, you know, a hundred plus people just work on one thing and like got regained the trust in the engine going. So if you ever want that kind of thing, I mean, just you get in touch with me and then I'll tell the story and, and put my like, you know, social capital behind it. So people believe it. Yeah. So I could be stories right. as a service as well, if you're eager to, <laughs> to tell that kind of story. So, all right, well, uh, cool. we'll put your Twitter handle in the show notes as well as your blog and, and make sure cool. that, that happens. Um, for all our viewers out there, uh, if you are thinking about product or product delivery or mobbing and thinking about things related to products, uh, this is uh, probably a great episode to share with them. So please share. And then for you yourself, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when new episodes come out. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye, everybody. See you. Bye.